Well, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome, everyone. Welcome those of you who are joining us online. Um, let's begin by asking the Lord's blessing on, uh, on this time together and our further illumination. Heavenly Father, your word is a lot deeper than any of us really recognize. There's so much that is there. There's so much that needs to be brought out. And so, therefore, we're really thankful um, that these who are here, those who will join us online, are interested enough in um, learning more about this word or gaining more from the word and um, not just being satisfied with what is said in, in the message, but that we can go deeper into it. These questions, other questions, these um, uh, interaction, Lord, I know that you use this in a, in a, in a very um, edifying way to teach us more to increase the, the grace that we get through the means of grace. So ask your blessing um, as we delve deeper into these things and uh, that, that the questions that I don't have the answers to or that we can't immediately find the answers to, that we just uh, would simply be able to go look them up and to find out later and bring it back next week. I give you the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen and amen. Okay, um, questions about this very light subject that we're talking about. Yes, ma'am, Miss Candy. <laughs> um, I, I know uh, Galatians does, but uh, um, I'm always thinking it means sharing the gospel with somebody. Is, are there other aspects of it? Yes, the question is defined for you, and that's an excellent um, question. Um, actually, in the written version of this, um, I say that there's no way we can possibly answer that question because it's huge. It, books are written on what is meant by the fruit. Um, now, uh, one of the obvious answers is, is out of Galatian, the, the fruit of the Spirit. And those are definitely fruits, but I wouldn't even in this context say that that's where it begins. That's kind of the out put of it, um, because someone can go and look at all of those words and try to follow them very carefully, but not have a heart that is in love with God and is in love with Christ and has been born again and changed through Christ. So you can have the fruits of the Spirit in the sense of trying to accomplish those things without actually having the fruit or bearing fruit, okay? So what does God mean when he says, um, I want fruit from my fig tree? And what does Jesus mean when he tells the Jews of the day, the religious leaders of the day, that the kingdom will be taken away from you and given to some who bear fruit, okay, who will bear its fruit? So the question kind of expands, and it's not just what is spiritual fruit, but what is fruit of the kingdom, because that's the specific kind of fruit that is being talked about. Now just imagine, if you would, a physical kingdom, okay? A physical kingdom, a king and a queen and a whole bunch of subjects. Remember, a kingdom is a king, a dominion, and subjects. Now what would be the fruit do you think, of a kingdom like that? What would be involved with bearing the fruit of the kingdom itself? Faithfulness to the king, one thing. It's to be a subject of the king, not to be undermining the king, not to be working against the king, not to be ignoring the king, not to, be, to recognize the sovereignty of the king. So how do we get there? How do we recognize the sovereignty of the kingdom of God? It is to be surrendered to God, and it is involving everything that is wrapped up in the statement when Jesus says the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And everything that is wrapped up in that, if you truly love God, and by the way, the only way that you're going to ever truly love God in that way is if your heart has been redeemed, if you have been regenerated. Otherwise, you are at enmity with God, okay? So you can't bear fruit if you're at enmity with God. 
You can't bear the fruit of his kingdom. So you have to be his. You have to be a regenerated member of the kingdom. It gets a little complicated when you start talking about the elect and predestination and how can I ask someone to bear fruit when they really can't bear fruit unless they are redeemed. Well, they're given the opportunity because Jesus says, unless you repent, you will likewise perish. If you choose not to repent, then you will not bear fruit. You're given the opportunity to repent. The problem is, unless you have a redeemed heart, you really can't repent in that way. I know I'm talking in circles, but it's, it's a complicated um, uh, that's a complicated part of it. But to bear the fruit of the kingdom is to be faithful to the king. It is to be faithful to the kingdom. It is to do the work of the kingdom. What is the work of the kingdom? Well, if the king tells you to go out and cultivate the fields, it's cultivating the fields. If he tells you to join the army and go out and fight, it's join the army and go out and fight. If he tells you that I want you to go evangelize and I want you to be on the front line, this is what I want you to do. I want you to leave your job, leave your home. I want you to go someplace and be my evangelist. Then to do that is bearing the fruit that God has put before you. You see, fruit is not exactly the same for every single individual. There are general fruits, fruit of the Spirit, the ethical standards of the kingdom that Jesus established in his Sermon on the Mount, right? These are all the standards by which we define fruit. But when you really get down to what it is, Jesus says something in the sixth chapter of, of John. And, and, and let me just go and read this because I think it, it helps to answer that. Um, it, it's John 6 and um, starting in um, verse 25. John 6, 25. Of course, now we know that what's just happened. Jesus has fed the 5,000. They've come back across the, the Sea of Galilee, walking on the water. Now he's over on the uh, western shore of the Sea of Galilee. The people have either gotten in boats or run back around the northern end, and they're once again inundating him with more information. What they actually want, not more information. They want more food is what they want. They, they, they want lunch, right? And so there's what Jesus says. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. Now that's a very strong statement of what the fruit of the kingdom is. Do the work of the kingdom that's how you bear fruit. Then in, verse 20, then in verse 28, then they said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? Okay, what must we be doing to bear the fruit of the kingdom? Jesus answered them, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. Okay, the belief and the following and the surrender to Jesus, and then all the things that he says that go in with that, pick up your cross and follow me, deny yourself, to follow, this is the, the, the standards of the kingdom, and to do whatever I tell you to do as your sovereign Lord and master. That's fruit. So fruit for me might not be exactly the same thing as fruit for you. Now, there are certain things we all should do. We all should be able to share our faith. We all should be able to tell other people about Jesus both in what we say and what we do. There should be an obvious fruit that is being born there. But not everyone is going to have exactly the same kind of fruit. And, and one of, the, one of the, the important parts of every Christian sanctification and also an important function of the church, but sometimes I think it is too, too put too much on the church, is for you to find out what your fruit is what it is that God has called you to do. You know, how can you be a servant? And what, in what vein, what is the place that you can bear fruit within the, uh, the body of Christ, within the kingdom of God? Okay, so I know there's probably a lot more information than you asked, but you, you asked the question. 
that's a big question. You know what I mean? And there's no simple answer to that. I mean, we can either easily say fruits of the Spirit, but it's much, much more than that. Much more than that. Okay? Yes, ma'am. It, does it connect up with everything that James says as far as, you know, your, your works does not save you, but, but your, your faith is dead without works? Absolutely. Absolutely. That you're, and, and that's that little snippet that I gave you at the very end, you know, um, that's exactly what, what that means uh, and what, what it goes, is that if you are his, if you have faith, you're, you're, you're not the same. You can't be the same. It's an impossibility to, to be redeemed and regenerated with a whole new heart and soul and to show nothing on the outside. To take it in stride and just keep on being the person that you were. And, and, and if that's where a person is, they should look and see if the axe is at the root of the tree. <laughs> because you can't bear fruit outside of Christ. So yes, it, it has to do with um, true faith will always result in works. Fruit for the kingdom. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, with, that, with that being said, I'm going to ask you to please repeat something from the sermon because I think it's very applicable to your, your questions and answer. Uh, that very much like, say, any large farm, at the end when the fruit is gathered, harvested, right? Not everybody is part of the harvest. But there were many people from the beginning, from clearing out the land and the planting and everything that occurs. There were many hands. You weren't the one that gathered the fruit at the end, but you did. There were many works for all of the all, all of those farmers, that whole group of people, to at the end get the land to yield the fruit, which is the right. end. And, 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 and. Yeah, the the end product is not just to the harvesters. Um, that there's a, a, a huge process that goes, and, and there's a process that even goes beyond that. There are those who clear the land, take all the stones out of the land, and put the, the walls up, who cultivate the land, who do the sowing and do the watering and things like that. Yes, and, and, and Jesus somewhere says, I think it's Jesus who says that uh, you're, you're going to, or is it, no, it's God who says, oh, gosh, I'm in the wrong testament. Um, it's, it's God who's telling the children of Israel, you're going to have cisterns you didn't dig and orchards that you didn't plant. You, you know, that you, you're, you're coming into some work that other people have done. And so, yes, very, very uh, important that fruit is not always just the evangelist who is the one who shares the, 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 the faith with someone else. Um, the fruit is also that Miss Janet who taught the child simply Jesus and her fruit is born when that child as, a, as an adult remembers what they were taught as a child and implements it and shares the fruit and the, the fruit is born. Well, the fruit's been going on in that particular person's life since they started. So everyone who is involved with it is actually bearing fruit through that individual. Does that make sense? If, if, if you could please repeat for us the part in the sermon about the, uh, where you gave the explanation about the conversation between the uh, vineyard owner, God the Father, or not so, but and um, the vine dresser and the anthropomorphic okay. terms or, 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 or that used to... Well, I don't know where, where I, I say what it's not, to, yeah, to, yeah, to yeah. clearly what it's not. There, there's, there, there's a conversation going on in this parable between the landowner and the vine dresser. Now, what has happened, unfortunately, with this parable and with a whole bunch of other parables is that people allegorize it. They want to make, and a parable is something that we concentrate on the principles. And hopefully you could say, I didn't have an awful lot of time to make the application at the end, but I think I, I spit out like five or six applications. Now, if I'm 
turning that into an allegory, I've only got one application, the application of the allegory, which would be, for instance, that it, this would be the judgment upon Israel as the favorite son of God. Um, and that would be that the conversation would be such that it would be between God the Father, who um, is the, uh, the landowner, and God the Son, who's the vine dresser. And that is quite um, a, a popular view here because, you know, Jesus, of course, is all about mercy and the God of the Old Testament is all about judgment and, and severity. Well, wait a minute. Wait, wait just a minute. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible doesn't teach that there is a different God in the Old Testament than there is in the New Testament. It's the same God. And you need to be very careful, actually, about assigning something to God that Scripture doesn't assign. Now, if you didn't have any of those psalms like the ones I read, uh, I think it was from the 35th or the 25th Psalm, I can't remember, where, you know, it's just over and over again, oh, your loving kindness, you're, 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 you're so loving and, and gracious and, and, and um, compassionate to your people. The Old Testament is filled with that kind of language. It's not like that language is only in the New Testament. It's in the Old Testament. So maybe if that was the way it was, then you could say, well, uh, um, you, you know, God was, uh, um, it's not that he changed, it's just that that was part of his providential plan. Well, some of the, uh, of the severity in the Old Testament is part of his providential plan and did to a degree change with the culmination of that plan in Jesus Christ. But there has never been the, okay, the father is, is all uh, severity and the son is all um, mercy or all kindness because the scripture simply blows that idea out of the water. Um, but still people say that's the way it is. They look at the fig tree and they say this is Israel. Um, they forget the fact that Jesus is probably at the time not just talking about Israel but very much talking about the religious leaders within Israel. That's where his focus was. Um, and certainly not one that we could take out of that realm if indeed that's all he's talking about. But that's what they say. They say that the three years is about the length of Jesus' ministry. So they, they apply that three years and they say, well, they had their chance and that was the kindness. No, it's not. Not according to the parable. That wasn't the kindness. The kindness came after the three years um, and giving it another year, a fourth year. And then, of course, the cutting down or the digging up of the fruit tree would be 70 AD when there was a, the destruction of Israel. So that, 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 that's nice and neat. And then people who say it, they, they act like they've made a great discovery when actually that is not what the parable is about. That is not the way that we look at parables. That is a harmful hermeneutic, a harmful interpretation of of scripture because it paints God out to be somebody that he's not. So therefore, the best way to look at this particular one is not a discussion between God the Father and God the Son. It's not a discussion between the Old Testament God and a New Testament God as if they're different. What it is, and by the way, there are so many modern evangelicals who preach that and teach it that the Old Testament is next to worthless. Um, it, it's just a bunch of stories, and we should not pay attention that when God brings Joshua into the promised land and says, I want you to annihilate every man, woman, and child, that's not God speaking, that, that's, or that's Old Testament. Well, no, God doesn't change, folks. He's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So if he said that, that was the severity that he said at that time, then we should see it as that way and not try to, you know, explain it away. But nonetheless, rather than do that, the best way to look at this is anthropomorphically. And I know that most of you know what anthropomorphism means. It is to try and discuss something that is not human using human terms. When we talk about God's right hand, we're talking anthropomorphically because he doesn't have a right hand. When we, we talk about anything that is humanly recognizable about God, 
It, it's not when we give him gender, and it's because the scripture gives him gender. It's not because he has gender. Those are anthropomorphisms that are designed so that we can understand God better and from a human standpoint. That's why we refer to him as father, because that, that's a relationship that helps us understand that, that person of, of God. And so when we talk about it anthropomorphically, they are personified attributes of God. God is both severe and he's kind. So let's personify those two and say it's like a, like a conversation between the landowner and the vineyard vine dresser, okay? It's not, all right? But it, it's, it's like those two ideas are um, the, 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 the way that we're seeing it, a personified discussion of the one true God, the one being, not splitting the God into God the Father and God the Son. That's going too far. The, that's not supportable by the parable. So we keep it into the confines of the parable. Is that basically what... Um, I mean, that's basically repeating what, what we said there. Questions? Yes, ma'am, Miss Rhonda. I think um, the Isaiah reading um, where, you know, um, uh, God is so definitive here in his judgment, um, one of the more interesting parts of, of today's reading is that um, almost like the landowner doesn't have the final word. It's almost like you want it. It's it's almost like it was cut off before the end uh, because the, the vine dresser isn't the decision maker here. And I'm I'm just wondering, is there any aspect here at all to sometimes the Lord relents from a, something that He intends of prayer? And I just wondered if there was any aspect. Um. Okay, before we answer that particular question, which you ended it on a question that was going a different direction than I thought you were going, um, because you know I can basically answer that question easily, and, and the answer is, is no, God does relent. But when he relents, it's not because he changed his mind, and it's not because someone prayed and God said, that's an anthropomorphism that you find some places in Scripture where God says, I changed my mind, or he's asked to change his mind. That's to uh, help us understand. If God is sovereign, if he is completely omniscient, then there is nothing that God doesn't know. If he is the sovereign Lord of all creation, and he has created all that is, then there is such a thing as his eternal decree. And his eternal decree is that all things that come to pass, God has ordained. There's nothing outside of that. And so we ask ourselves, what on earth is the reason for prayer? And why does he call us to pray if that is going to change? If, if he's already decided he's going to do that in the first place, why does he ask us to pray for it? Well, not to, when Jesus says, ask the Father anything in my name, it has more to do with putting you in sync with God than it does God in sync with you. Does that make sense? In, in other words, it's an elevation for you to be in, the, in, in line with what the Lord is doing, and that is a heightened state of spirituality that is gained through prayer is because when you pray and you're in beginning to really understand prayer, you know that you're not praying for your will to be done, but his will to be done. And when you begin to, the, the, the higher levels of sanctification are levels where you begin to pray more in line with God's heart than your own fallen heart when you first were saved. I don't know if that makes sense, but you know, as we grow closer and more Christ-like and more like God, we reflect His His uh, um, heart more than our old fallen heart, and so therefore our prayers are more in line. I I never pray a prayer. I used to pray prayers all the time. Um, God, I need this. I need that. I need this. I need that. And 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 I almost never start a prayer now without Lord. What I really want is Your will. Your will be done, but you asked me to pray for these things, and I pray that it would be such and such. I intercede on this person's behalf. I pray for them. I, I ask for these things. God hears those prayers. 
I don't believe that it changes his mind. I don't think he can change his mind. But he wouldn't ask us to do it if it were not important in his overall plan. And I think probably the great importance is, is for us. Now go back and repeat. I, I decided to answer the second part of your question than the first. How did you get to that? What, what did you... Section in this where... where um... So, so, so when the mind, the, 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 that is mine. <laughs> right. Oh, okay. Oh, oh, now, now it is. Yes, 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 yes. That actually is a very important part of this parable, and I had to leave it out. And 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 this is that it's open ended. Okay, it doesn't. There's no conclusion. There, there's we don't see. You're you're left asking the question: Did it bear fruit, or did it get torn out? You, you know what was the result of this? But that's by design. That's by design because you see. Only principles are being shared here, established, not outcomes, all right? Now, if part of the principle was an outcome, well, that would be very close to name and claim it, wouldn't it, right? Okay, you, you, so in order to be able to apply this in all different kinds of places, there's no outcome. The question is, what will the outcome be in that application? What will your outcome be? What will the outcome of an unbeliever be? What will the outcome of a believer who's not bearing fruit as they should? What would that be? So it's left open for that reason, purposely. Okay, And that's just one of those things I, I wasn't able to bring out. There's not, not enough time. But that is a, that's, that's very intuitive to pick that up because it is. It was left that way on, on a, for a purpose. Some of your applications, um, in, in the life of a nation or the life of an individual, Seems as though, um, sort of like from the outside looking, and it seems as though God gives um, more second chances, 50th chances, 200th chances right. to some individuals or some nations. And it, 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 like, um, <laughs> I guess one of the songs we sang was the, the potter, and the, you know, it's, it's his decision right. of whether somebody gets. Seemingly fewer chances, and somebody gets many, many more, or a nation, or what have you. Yeah. So is that part of what's going on here as well? Yeah, it's, it's the, the the idea of second chances is left open ended because it's almost never second chances. It was a second chance with with uh, with Jonah. He, he's the only one who got a second chance. We we get multiple, multiple, multiple chances. And, you know, I was raised in the Southern Baptist Church, and my parents took me to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Thursdays, you know, Wednesday night. I mean, I, was, I lived at church. I cannot tell you how many times I heard the gospel. I can't tell you how many times there was an invitation to accept the gospel. Of course, I did it when I was nine years old, because everybody did it when they're nine years old, because they don't want to go to, they want, don't want to go to hell. But I went through all of that with all those opportunities to accept Christ, and I never did. Okay, then I rejected him. He should have fired me. I mean, he should have destroyed me at that time. Uh, and I spent 20 years, obviously, in, 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 in struggling with that before he finally taught me a lesson. And, and then he brought me, and I finally accepted Christ when I was 40. How many chances did I get? An untold number of chances. You, you see, so it's not second chance. It's multiple chances. How many chances does a nation get? That's why I say... And I hope that you understand this when I put it this way, because I know, and I see you, Steve, I'll, I'll call you right after this. But I, I hope you understand when I say that God's patience is infinite, that what I'm trying to avoid saying is that there's a limit to God's patience. And whenever we see that in Scripture, that's an anthropomorphism, because there is no limit to God's patience. He's infinitely patient. But his providence, his ordained will, states that after so many chances, then that's when the severity occurs. Okay, until you've had that many, just like what he says 
to Abraham, the sins of the Amorites have to be completed. 400 years is going to take for the sins of the Amorites to work to the point that they cross that line of my providence, and then I'm going to give Joshua the sword to go in and bring my vengeance, my judgment upon them. Okay, so that's very much the, 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 the idea. It's always God's providence. So who knows what God's providence is? Who knows how many chances he gives a nation? Who knows how many chances he's going to give this nation? You know, before he, and, and I think probably if we can look at the history of the Israelites. And, and, and for me, when that vine dresser says, give it just another year. Um, what that says to me is, God, you have invested so much in these people. I mean, you have, we're talking about millennia that you have invested in them. And let the, let the sequence spill out. Let, let it continue. Give them a chance to, to, to accept Christ. Give them a chance to accept Peter and John and Stephen. You know, give them a chance to listen to these great evangelists before you cross that line. Okay? I mean, I, I, that's, that's the way I, I see it. So there would have been perhaps more chances for children of Israel than there would have been for the Amorites. Who knows? All right, Steve, sorry. Mind. And, I, and I've heard that the only thing that God cannot do is sin. And maybe it's not the same thing as changing his mind, but I know I, there are three instances I'm thinking of where it appears that God changed his mind. One was when he was getting ready to destroy all the Israelites up on the mountain with Moses. And Moses says, you know, please don't do this. It'll, it'll make you look bad. Wow. And then uh, another one was when the uh, the king was uh, uh, the prophet told the king that God told me you're going to die. You better get ready. And he he prayed, and God said, "Okay, I'm going to go for 15 years." And then another a parable that I think it was Jesus told her about the lady going to the judge and just hounded him until he changed his mind. So that, that implies that he can change his mind or will change. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. A, a great um, a way to put it, those three examples are all examples that appear that God is changing his mind. So let's make sure that we, that we recognize what is anthropomorphic in that. And what is theological in that? From a theological standpoint, if the only thing that the statement that you made, the only thing that God can't do is sin, it is not necessarily complete. In other words, is it possible for God to make a rock so big he can't lift it? Is it possible for God to make a rock so big that he can't lift it? Okay? I mean, they're, they're, that's illogical. God is not illogical. He's not going to do things contrary to his nature. So when we talk about changing one's mind, we think of it in human terms. That means that my mind I was entirely intent on doing this. And something came up that made sense to me that I wasn't aware of. And so that caused me to change my mind and do something else. Well, if God was like that, if God was mutable, meaning he could change his mind or could change in any way, and the Bible tells us that's not true, but if he could change, then it would be possible. I'm not saying it would be probable or anything that scripture would say, but it would be possible for God to change his mind about salvation and about redemption. He, he could say, okay, I changed my mind. Um, just like so many people think that it's going to happen at the end times, uh, there's going to be a second sort of salvation. It's not going to be on Jesus. It's going to be through the, the return to temple worship, all right? And, and I changed my mind. I, I said it was going to be, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, but I'm going to change it a little bit here. That can't happen with God because he's immutable. He cannot change. 
Because to change in that sense would be against his nature. And God cannot act against it. God is bound, and everybody thinks that God can do everything. But God is bound by his godness. Okay, God cannot be not God. He can't be un-God. So therefore, whatever the definitions of the attributes of God are, he is bound, in a sense, by that. Now, the only reason that I can say he's bound is because that's something that a human understands. God is actually, at the same time that he is he, he, he's bound, he's also infinite, meaning he can't be bound. All right? So, in, in a theological sense, that's not true. But in a historical sense in the, the Bible, for him to hear a prayer and say in an anthropomorphic sense, I relent, I will do this, does not mean that he actually received new information that caused him to change his mind. Because that would mean what? It would mean he was not only immutable, it would mean he was not omniscient. And if God is not omniscient, then he's not God. Because that means there would be something outside of God's knowledge, of his knowing. So therefore, the, the, these are very defining attributes of God. So when God changes his mind in Scripture, those are anthropomorphic. To change his mind, to say that he can't change his mind is not to say he can't switch directions. It can't say that, okay, when all of these cogs come into place, then I'm going to change directions. That's what he did with Jesus. It's a different covenant. It's a, it's a lot of things that were part of the Old Testament covenant are no longer there anymore. And that's one of the reasons the Jews have such problems with the New Testament. Wait a minute, you're telling me circumcision isn't essential anymore. I, I, I can't abide with that. That uh, uh, worship on Saturday is, is no longer necessary. It's the Lord's Day. I can't abide with that either. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? It's not really him changing his mind, although to us it looks like it. Because that's the way it's presented to us in Scripture, as you said, very clearly. Ms. Candy. Uh, uh, given those examples of God and perfectly. Now, I want you to go out and put an example of God in that word. I know that's perfect. Go ahead, I'm sorry. said. I wish that, I hope that that actually did get picked up. But that the, the, the prayer of Hezekiah um, had more to do with Hezekiah than it did with changing God's mind. That, that bring, that's bringing Hezekiah into a closer relationship with him to actually bring Hezekiah into his will, in a sense, to strengthen that very close bond that prayer as a means of grace does. That's one of the primary reasons that God insists and encourages us to pray. First of all, he wants that time with us. He's jealous of our time and likes us to spend time reaching out to him. But for Hezekiah to cry out to the Lord is what the Lord wants from Hezekiah. And so therefore, it's not so much that he changed his mind when he cried out. It was the crying out that he wanted. So very good. Very, very good. Well said. Yes, sir. Yeah, I want to ask you what you was what you were preaching this morning about fine dressing and, and, and all. Uh, first Corinthians, I mean, first Corinthians 4 chapter. And the, the, the fig tree and the figs, which is what be the what be the people, right? Well, it depends on what the application of the principle is. 
It can be people, it can be nations, it can be leaders, it can be a church. It, 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 I mean, we can apply that principle on many different levels. But in First Corinthians, the fourth chapter, when it talks about one plant, one water, right. but God gives the increase. Right. That principle there was uh, would be the same, or it would. I think what Paul is talking about there is the, um, the redemptive process and how that comes about. I believe this is what Robert was talking about earlier, that there are a lot of people working in the vineyard that bring that fruit to bear, not just the vine dresser, not just the one. So one plants and other waters, but actually it's God who brings it about. There, there's, you can, and, and, and just to put that into a redemptive situation, um, you, you can water with the gospel all you want somebody that the Lord's not going to regenerate and it's just you're just watering okay it's God that brings the increase it is God who brings that about so that's more of what Paul is talking about there um, but th making it clear that um, bearing fruit in that particular example the one who sows is bearing the fruit that the Lord has called him to bring because they're actually bearing fruit. The one who waters is bearing fruit because that's what the Lord has called them to do, is to water. Boys, also being witnesses for Christ. Witnesses for Christ. Faithful to what God's called to do. Witnesses. You know, one of my favorite stories uh, along that line was um, there, there was a, a missionary. I, I only remember him as, as his name, last name, Dr. Thompson. Um, and he came to Coral Ridge at one time, and he spoke there. And he spoke of his parents um, that were living in, um, um, oh, not Vietnam, but uh, Cambodia. And they were in Cambodia before communism and working in a village there. And they worked their entire lives witnessing to that village without a single convert. Not one person came to know the Lord. When the Khmer Rouge moved into that area, they wiped out all the missionaries and this man's parents lost, lost their lives. They were killed. 20, 30 years later, he went back to that village just to visit the place where his parents had lost their lives. And in that place where his parents worked their entire lives and did not have one convert was a thriving Christian community. And he said, what on earth happened here? He says, well, when we saw the way your parents died, when we saw that they, the love of Christ in their eyes, then we knew that that was the truth. And so therefore, from that point on, there had been many waterers to water the seeds that his parents had planted, and there's a thriving Christian community there where there was not, and yet the parents never saw that. And and think about working your whole life without a single convert, you know. And and, and but then too, when you get to heaven, and all of a sudden all these people start coming in, this massive crowd of people who are the children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren and great-great-great all the way down spiritually and says, you're the guys who planted the seed. Somebody else watered, somebody else tended, but you're the ones who planted the seed. That's why God calls us. Not all of us are called to give our lives in the jungles of Cambodia. That was what his parents were called to do. And they bore fruit, even though they weren't the ones who actually saw the fruit come about. One of the, one of the great missions stories. Yes, ma'am. That the fruit that we bear is judged by God, mm -hmm. then the fruit that those parents bore in Cambodia was not just the souls of the people 20 years later, but the daily obedience, the daily yes. faithfulness. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, well said. It, it wasn't just uh, the, the souls redeemed. That's the increase that God gives. It was that faithfulness. And, and, and I can tell you that faithfulness in a dry place is, is hard. 
you know what I mean? I can imagine there were many times that they just said, well, I'm going to pack it up and go home. This is, this is a waste of time. Um, but obviously not. You know, you see the increase. Yes, ma'am. Uh, take it back to what we were talking before about, um, you know, wait, looking for Hezekiah's you know, relationship and stuff. I thought about God. God's in eternity, and we're not. We're limited. We see this here, and he sees the whole thing. So it's kind of like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. We're limited. Of course we are. We see around the corner. Right, because, and so when he says that in Scripture, because he's in eternity and we're not. He knows his way that I, um, and I've said this many times, but I'll repeat it. Um, that camera right there is taking pictures at 30 frames a second. Okay? 30 frames a second, it's running by. And the way we see that is we start at frame number one and we bzzz, go all the way through to the last frame. We see things in linear order. God, on the other hand, sees all of those frames at the same time on one big storyboard. All right, every single frame that, that is taken of all humanity is all in front of him. He knows the beginning from the end. He knows what happens in the end for each and every one of us. So it's a completely different um, uh, scenario, and it kind of makes it silly to put your trust in yourself, doesn't it, when you can't see around the corner, okay? You, you know, and, and, and you, you, you only have an attention span that's worth about 30 minutes, <laughs> If that much. <laughs> yes. Uh, any more questions? Um, we've got uh, about 10 minutes left. Just to, to, to her point and, and that, I, I would ask you, um, and, and if you would agree that when God asks a question or makes uh, a statement, it's really rhetorical because he already knows the answer. Kind of, um, I guess, coming back to the, the word of the day, an anthropomorphism to uh, make it relatable and, and, and tangible for us. Yeah, it actually goes back to what Candy said earlier that there's a purpose, but it's not necessarily him coming to a, a new realization that everything is planned and everything that happens is ordained. And this is so important for us to understand why we suffer and what goes on during suffering because um, God always has a plan. He doesn't do random at all. And when we suffer, there are many different reasons that are part of it and what he wants out of us is faithfulness. As, as we can take Job, of course, as the great example of that. You know, it's um, God, his suffering had nothing to do with him. It was all, uh, you know, the, the Satan, the, the devil's doing. Candy, you had a... a... Yeah. <clears throat> uh, I'd like to use um, Daniel's prayer in chapter 9, um, verses 16 through uh, 19, when I pray for our nation and for revival, and um, <clears throat> I just, uh, you know, he, he uh, of course, is confessing his sin and the, and the iniquities of uh, the nation of Israel, um, but in verse 17, he says, Now therefore, our God, listen to the prayer of your servant and to his peace for mercy, and for your own sake, O Lord. Uh, make your face to shine upon your sanctuary, which is desolate, and uh, you know, incline your ear, open your eyes. Uh, we do not present our pleas for you because of our righteousness, but because of your great mercy. O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, pay attention and act. Delay not for your own sake, O oh my God, because your city and your people are called by your name. Um, I, I wonder sometimes, you know, is it presumptuous of me, uh, thinking back to the founding of our nation, to feel that our country was called by his name, and, and that, uh, uh, you know, do this also, Lord, for your own sake, for the sake of your name. Uh, I know we're different than Israel, but, but in a sense, it seems that our country was founded on biblical principles, beginning with the Puritans who came here to uh, for religious
religious freedom. So is it okay to apply that, those verses when praying for revival I, I, I think it's and okay. mercy? I, I think it's okay to apply those verses to anything that you could apply it to because those are that's a heartfelt prayer of a man who um, is separated from the temple, separated from the sacrifices and the priests and everything, and has remained faithful for all those years. And, and, and you know what's about to happen. Um, Gabriel's going to come answer that prayer. And one of the great scenes of the Old Testament that describes the spiritual warfare that goes on around us that we're not aware of Gabriel says, well, I've I, I got to go help Michael. He's fighting the angel of Persia. You know, I, 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 I have to go and deal with this spiritual war that's going on. But I wanted to bring this and tell you that God hears your, your prayers. Uh, marvelous, marvelous. And then, of course, he gets the 70-week um, uh, um, prophecy that comes. So, yes, I think that is fine. And, yes... Um, I think that it is important that we remember the foundations upon which this country was, was established. Um, I, I shy away from politics as much as I possibly can. And I shy away very much from the idea of um, religious politics, okay? This is God's country and... Uh, religious patriotism, if you will, where, where, the, where the line between patriotism and, and God and religion is blurred, and we start seeing ourselves as sort of the answer uh, of God's, you know, blessing on earth. That's, that's what the Jews were doing, and, and, the, and they learned otherwise. But to recognize that we as a country were founded not just by Christian principles, but by reformed Christian principles, okay? We were, these are the Puritans. The, the, these are the reformers that left England and, and to look for a place that they could um, share their faith. Now, of course, later on, Quakers and Catholics and all kinds of people came over as well. But um, I, to, to see this country established, the very men who may put together the Constitution, I mean, there is a huge push to rewrite history, just like there's a huge push to rewrite biology. And the fact that people will buy into that it just shows the, the lunacy of our age. But, and, and I think part of it, don't get me started on this, but I think part of it, it has to do with virtual reality. I mean, we can make anything happen we want to with CGI graphics. We can make dinosaurs come to life. And so whatever we say it is, that's what it is. And unfortunately, that seems to have passed over into logic and reason. Whatever we say it is, it is, regardless of it isn't, you know. Um, but so it, that, that has a, a, a kind of where we have headed. So we, weren't, we didn't start that way. But that doesn't mean that we're God's chosen people by any means. What it means is that we have been given much as a nation. We have been blessed much as a nation. Somewhere in the mid-70s, um, I believe with Francis Schaeffer that that began to change, that we abrogated our responsibility. Um, actually, probably before that in the mid-60s. But we abrogated our responsibility. The church abrogated its responsibility. And as goes the church, so goes the country. And I think that we're getting ready to face that. But to pray for the return, if you would just add one thing to that for me. And uh, this was a conversation that I had with the men yesterday morning, um, that you would pray first for the church, because that's where the real problem is. If you go through all of history, and you go through all of biblical history, the disasters are almost always because the people of God have become apostate. And God brings judgment on everyone because his church has ceased to be his church. And, and, and that's, if, if we need to pray for the revival of the American church, that we would turn back to God, that we would turn back to the Bible, that we would begin to teach and preach and live the truth, which we haven't done now for decades. And there's all kinds of things that go on in churches 
most of them do not have anything to do with the truth. Right? And, and God will not be mocked. And there's a line in the sand. And whether or not we are headed for that line, there's nothing, you know, the severity is there. We're going to meet the judge. I can't tell you that. But I feel the need as a pastor to call out the culture, to call out what I see as satanic in the culture, and to call the church people to pray because what happens is the culture infiltrates the church and the church ceases to be the church, although it's still called the church. And it's no longer the church of Jesus Christ. No longer is it bearing fruit for the kingdom. It's bearing fruit for something else. So you can pray that prayer, but pray it for the church as well. Please, all of you, I, 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 we, we need to be in prayer for the church. Uh, yes, Steve. Well, I, I mean, I think I'm afraid that our country, some of you mentioned earlier, Scott um, the, only, I, the only reason I believe that Israel still exists is because God made a covenant. He doesn't break. But he also made a covenant with the church. Mm -hmm. And so the church is the remnant of our survival. Whether we're in this country or South America. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and Steve, quite frankly, um, if God brings judgment upon this country, it would be good for the church. And, and, and I, don't, I say that knowing that I have children and grandchildren, and I don't want them to face what, what could happen in this country, but it would be good for the church. The church needs the correction, um, and I just pray it's not too severe. Anything in the Bible remotely refers to something that looks like the United States or right. any other country else. No, Israel is unique in all the world. And, 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 and by the way, that does not necessarily mean the nation that is now called Israel. There's, a, there, there's an Israel of God and there's the, the Jewish people. Um, and so there, there's, there is a very special relationship that God has with the Jews. And the, the, uh, America is not w one of those. We are simply another one of those countries like Germany, like Switzerland, like the Netherlands, like England, like Scotland, and like America, who have been blessed with an amazing history of revival and resources for the kingdom of God. We've been blessed amazingly. And one by one, those countries have become apostate to now less than 5% of those countries, and I think it's less than 2% of Scotland, that identify as Christians or are willing to identify as Christian. So in other words, we have gone from this most amazing country filled with fire-breathing Presbyterians to a, a country that's selling all the churches, making bars out of them, you know, because that's kind of the, 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 the way that it's done. So, I mean, that's what happens when God gives you over to your base instincts. That's what happens when he removes his hand of blessing. And um, I, I, I fear that that's what, that's what has happened. And that, and that, I fear, is the reason for the inexplicable things. And we, again, the men talked about this yesterday. It doesn't make any sense. The whole gender thing doesn't make any sense. Who can possibly believe that just because a, a woman says I'm a man, that a man can have a baby? I, I mean, it just, that's lunacy. And for anyone to accept that and to say that that would be the reality of things is to accept lunacy. It is to accept ridiculous, um, easily provable things. And if you're going to believe something like that, it shows a chaos of thought. And, and if there's chaos, it's not from God. And if it's not from God, it's satanic. So much of what's going on in this country right now is defined 
designed and calculated chaos. It happened in Russia in 1917. It happened in Germany in the 30s. It happened in China and Mao Zedong's China. Any place you have seen this kind of activity, it has been with that in mind, with that purpose. Chaos in order to destroy the organizations that are the boundaries that God has put in place. And the boundaries that God has put in place are the boundaries of marriage, destroyed. Boundaries of family, destroyed. First thing that's got to go, the church will be destroyed. Then, government as we know it. Those are all boundaries that God has put in place in his common grace so that the gospel can go forward in peace. And when Satan really begins to attack, those are the things that are destroyed. I, I hate to leave you with a cheery thought, but, you know, it, it, it is, it, it, that's the reason I say pray for the church. Please pray for the church in this country because what we are seeing is, is this is infiltrating into the church. Okay, the, the, the ideas are all coming into the church and being embraced. Guys, that is what happened in Nazi Germany. That is exactly what happened with the Lutheran church in Nazi, Nazi Germany. They, they fell to Hitler and started Heil Hitlering and doing the Aryan creeds. Okay, it, it's, it, it, that's the way it works. That's the way Mao Zedong got, got China. Was, he didn't kick all the church out immediately. He infiltrated it from the inside. And destroyed it that way. So, I mean, it's, it's not like it's never been done before. And, and, and I, I make it short, this is the last one. Because don't, don't get, uh, Frank, you haven't spoken yet, so you, you get to speak. You know, for me, like a lot of people and everything, you know, um, I got young children, and it's hard to try to explain that to them. David watches and everything, because he don't come as much as he used to be. He watches online. I talk to him about this a lot, and then Gabby just getting married, my daughter. You know, I mean, how do you keep the spirits up? You know, so I try to explain it to them, like, well, other than the by gender thing, like you were just talking about, that's a little hard to explain. But I, that just blows me away, the same thing you said, even them talking about it. But I tell them, hey, when I grew up in the 60s, when I was our late, early 70s, they were dealing with war, and it's the same things we're dealing with now, with the wars they got. Yeah, yeah, it's things. completely different than that. We were under our desks expecting the yeah. new world cost. I mean, I mean, you know, we had those same things. And I think that every generation thinks that its generation is the most... Um, wicked. Okay. All I am saying is that in this generation, there are signs of chaotic, inexplicable activity. And when you see chaotic, inexplicable activity, it doesn't come from God. It comes from the enemy. And, and why else would some of the things that are happening and being accepted and put forward, why are they being accepted and put forward? And please, don't, I am I am so anti-political. I don't think that politics should ever enter a church. I, I think it's devastating for any church to get political. And, and these aren't political issues. These are moral issues. Why are these things happening? Why would a country simply decide one day that it is going to um, not do what every country on earth does, which is defend its borders? Every country on earth defends its borders. It's always been part of, I mean, that's not rocket science. That's basic country, how you have a country. Why would we all of a sudden open our borders? Why? Right. Destabilism, chaos. That, that, that's the designed. And, and the people who are behind this, they're, they're not getting caught off guard. This is orchestrated. This is orchestrated in what I'm trying to say as a pastor it's not only orchestrated, it's satanic, okay? So we're, we're not looking at just liberal, conservative, right, left, Republican, Democrats, none of that. This, there's, there's other things at work. And if there's going to be a hope for combating the forces of evil, it has to come from the church. And if the church is not being the church, if the church is falling like dominoes, which is exactly what they're doing, falling like dominoes, it just the Greek Orthodox Church just uh, announced worldwide that they will start performing same-sex marriages. Okay, I mean one by one, they're falling. Okay, it's it's infiltrating 
the church. And that's exactly the way that Satan has always worked. Okay? So pray for the church. And with that, I'm going to send you on your way for a merry afternoon. Um, is, today's a big day, isn't it? What's going on today? Oh, Super Bowl. Yeah. It, yeah. Right. Yeah. Y'all enjoy that. that uh, enjoy that. Uh, you, know, you, you know what's so strange about this one? It always falls, as long as I can remember, when we had first and third Sunday services, always the Super Bowl fell on the third Sunday. We always were, you know, I was always making the joke, you know, these are the really faithful, you know, we know who the core of the, of the church is, ones that are um, um, missing the Super Bowl, but now it's not. It's, uh, it's on the second Sunday, so who knows? Go figure. Well, let me pray, and I'll, I'll pray for these and other issues. Father, as, as we discuss these things, first of all, thank you for um, just some great conversation. Um, about the, the text, about the, um, what, what is brought out in this scripture, but it, it, it does lead to other things. And Lord, when we consider our, our background and our past and the way that you have blessed us, blessed us as a country, the way you have blessed the world through the missionary effort that has come from this country, and, and the way that um, so much medical help and financial help and the gospel has been shared and everything that you call us to do, we have seen that occurring in this country, and now we're beginning to see a dearth. We're beginning to see um, chaos. And so, Father, I pray for the church in this country. I pray for the pastors of those churches. I pray for the students in seminaries and the teacher in seminaries. Lord, that you would work your revival first there, because that, that's, that, those are the organizations churning out the pastors who are falling like dominoes to the culture. And Lord, we pray that your church would stand strong. And if you are indeed um, leading us to a time of, of uh, upheaval, that as Brother Frank was mentioning, we have children and we have grandchildren. And um, we, we just pray for, for them, their strength and solidity. And I know that it really places a a burden on us that we would prepare them for such a time that we would not, uh, we want to protect our children, but at the same time, we, we want them to be able to stand strong when the time comes. And we pray that it never would come, but if it is your will that it will, then help us to prepare our children, strengthen them in the Lord, strengthen them in the word that um, they, they would have the tools and the weapons that they need to stand against the, the, the storm, whatever it is. Lord, thank you again for these people. Give them safe travel as they go home. We'll give you the glory in Christ's name. Amen. Amen and amen. Sorry to leave on that note, but that's, that's where we are. Yeah, that's where we are. So. <laughs>